Inspirelers, we have such a treat for you. We are so excited to finally have somebody on to talk about human design. We've had so many people ask us to bring an expert on. I personally have wanted to talk to somebody about these specifics for a while, and we have the perfect person. Welcome, Holly Herbig. She is the world's leading specialist in human design manifestors. That's her specialty, but we're going to talk about all the different types today. Um, she facilitates official online teaching. She has a whole community exclusively for manifestors. She's a certified human design and gene keys teacher, which I really Really want to learn what gene keys even are. Um, she's also a business veteran with 15 plus years of experience in multi-million and multi-six-figure businesses under her belt. She, you have so many things going on here. She's a <laughs> clinical hypnotherapist. She's a breathwork facilitator, EFT and meditation practitioner, Reiki level two healer, and she's also trauma-informed. And we love trauma-informed people on this podcast. So Holly, welcome to Spiraling Higher. Oh welcome, my gosh, welcome. thank you. The craziest <laughs> thing ever about guesting on people's podcasts is hearing your own bio. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm realizing I do all of that. Whoa. All right. Yeah. I'm You're like, who are they talking about? Oh, that's me. <laughs> oh, that's me. Oh, okay, cool. Great. <laughs> well, we're so excited to have you on. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me here. I'm really looking forward to chatting about this. Yeah, I mean, I guess the first place to start is for you to give your interpretation of human design, how you've used it in your life, and maybe even just a quick little blurb on the different types, because anyone who's listening to this probably already knows what their type is, but we're here to really hear your interpretation of everything and take the information a little deeper. Yeah, a little human design 101, hey? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the textbook definition, quote unquote, of human design is that it's called the science of differentiation, which means the whole system is about showing you how you are different from everyone else around you, mm, which wow. just off the bat is really, really important in human design because every other system that we have of self-awareness, personal development, personality, energetics, they're all about homogenization. They're all about saying, but this is how you're the same as all of these other people. Our Zodiacs, so this is how you're the same as all of the other Geminis, right? Our um, mm. Myers-Briggs is this is how you're the same as all of the other ENFJs. Human design from the beginning says, we don't care how you're the same as everyone else. We care about all of the ways that you're uniquely individual. So mm. you are never, ever replicated completely. You will never meet somebody else with a design that is absolutely identical to yours. And that was enough for me to get interested in human design in the first place. As somebody who came from that kind of spirituality field where there are just so many acronyms and labels mm -hmm. and <laughs> systems to understand yourself in, human design felt appealing because mm. it, it had the potential to show me not all of the ways that I was the same as everyone else, because I knew that what I felt I was missing was an understanding of how and why I was different and why that was a really good thing. So human design, the origins of human design um, originated back in about the eighties with a guy whose name was Alan Krakenau, but he renamed himself Ra Uruhu. So if you get into human design, you'll see a lot of people referencing Ra. Um, Ra went on a kind of spiritual quest, like a three day, three night sojourn where he felt that the human design system channeled through him and he recorded it. He then spent the remainder of his life teaching human design and kind of gathering people together in Ibiza um, and human design began to ripple out from there. But we saw it really kind of take off in 2020, which mm -hmm. is not surprising given the global climate that we were in, right? A lot of people were thinking all of a sudden, oh, I, what the heck is going on with the world? It's falling apart. I need to understand myself. Um, but that's actually also referenced in the original human design teaching, which is really cool, really, really wow. woo-woo, um, that there's a talk about a seven-year paradigm shift that was going to begin in 2020 and complete in 2027, and that this is a collective shift where we are moving from um, this sort of collective oneness of we all have to be the same and so we've got you know capitalism and hustle culture and to you know toxic patriarchy and all of these things of be the same be the same be the same and by 2027 we will have moved into the place where we're individually um contributing 
to the growth of the collective in our own unique ways. So for a lot of us in human design, when we hit 2020 and all of a sudden people wanted to know their human design, we kind of shrugged our shoulders and went, yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> we, we thought this might come, right? Um, so that's why it's gotten really popular. But the, the kind of basics of human design are that it's a hybrid system. It's built from this kind of harmony of science on one side and spirituality and energetics on the other side. So on our science side, there's a lot of um, biomechanics, there's quantum physics, there's epigenetics, which is super cool for science nerds. On the spirituality side, it's built out of astrology, huge aspect of astrology. And you'll see that when you run your chart because you have to put in your birth details. Mm -hmm. And it's also got um, the I Ching, um, the chakra system, a couple of other things built into there. So kind of whatever lens you want to approach human design from, it's there. You can, you can grab it and start to unravel that cord. But what it does is that on the very surface level, human design will spit out your energy type. That's like the top of the surface. I was saying before we hit record that I call human design the onion because mm -hmm. it's just this like never ending system of layers because every layer you go through is a reference to another kind of system that's been brought in, right? The further you go down, the more detailed and the more individual it becomes. The only somewhat broad aspect of human design is that top outside layer of the onion, which is energy type. Mm. We have a society that's broken down into five different energy types. And this is, it, it sounds like kind of the broadest categorization, but it's actually so important because there are whole groups of energy types that all of a sudden realize, oh, I'm trying to operate in a way that I was never meant to to operate it's yeah. actually not correct for me at all so just energy type alone can change so much for a person do you want me to walk you through the five different energy types yeah that's yes right. absolutely yes. like Gina was saying cool. before I think most people if not all might know what their type is just based on going to like humandesign.com or something like that and putting in their birth details but it seems like once you define your type it's like okay but what do I do with that information and how do I actually align my life in that way? So yes, I would love for you to go into the energy types and then, yeah, going a bit deeper, how can we use this information so that we feel more aligned to ourselves? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. So like I said, five different energy types. Everybody is broken down into one category. Our, our most dominant type are our generators. These are at about 37% or so, 37 to 38% of society, which is Gina, holla to the generators, <laughs> right? Um, our generators are what we call sacral beings. So this is kind of that nod to the chakra system. It means that you have the energy center or the chakra of the sacral defined. It's lit up for you. It's like a freaking Christmas tree in there. You've got so much energy that is the center of your being. And that sacral energy is designed to respond. It's designed to create. It's designed to produce. It's designed to work hard. And it's designed to feel satisfied when you are doing those things. So our generators, of course, are the core basis for why we have the industrial society that we have because generators build things and then they show up in a sustained energetic way to keep those things alive. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our kind of inbuilt social structure, um, like the nine to five work day, the 40 to 50 hour work week, you know, having a, a recurring schedule, getting up at five o'clock every morning to do exercise, all of these things, they're normally quite aligned for a generator. Mm -hmm. So we have a big chunk of society that doesn't really have a, a, a big friction with the way that everybody else does things. And so mm -hmm. we tend to find that generators coming into human design go, that's interesting, but so what? <laughs> I, I'm not really at odds with anything in my life, right? This is, it's sort of all working for me. The catch for generators though, is that you can't be using that beautiful like sunshine energy that you've got for things that you feel obligated to do as yeah. soon as you start stepping into the space where you think I should do this I have to do this to keep other people happy this is the thing that's going to make me successful but I don't actually want to do it it doesn't light me up it doesn't bring me joy I don't feel satisfied 
you're going to drain that sacral battery really, really quickly. And you'll end up in what we call your not self theme, which is like the indicator from your body that shit's out of place, right? Like you are on the wrong road. (laughs) Nobody is happy. None of this is working. And the not self theme for generators is frustration. So you can usually pick a generator who is caught in the cycle of shoulds, right? Oh, I'm doing all of this work because I should, because this is going to get me somewhere. It's like the, I'll exchange my work to get to where I want to go, even though I don't enjoy the journey. Um, You can pick them because they're frustrated. They're frustrated with the system, with themselves, with life, with everything not working. It's like, um, you know, when you see toddlers get really frustrated that they can't do something correctly and they get that sort of full body like, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> like no, yes, that's what that's what a generator in their not self theme is like. Right. Um, so the key is always for the generator to learn how to identify what actually lights the sacral center up very Marie Kondo kind of style, like what sparks joy? What mm-hmm. What is it that you actually want to be responding to? Because, yes, you can respond to everything, but you're not designed to respond to everything. Mm-hmm. So only respond to the things that really are exciting and interesting and joyful for you because that is where you're going to feel satisfied, which is what you're really driving towards as a generator. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Then we have... Uh, oh, sorry, you go. Go, Sam. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking about all these generators who have aligned with, like you said, a lot of the uh, normalized structures in our society. But how many of those generators are doing that um, as a disservice to their actual souls and how yeah. hard it must be to actually be honest with themselves because to be honest with yourself about not liking what you're doing or exchanging that sacral energy for Oh, is to welcome so much change into your life. I mean, Gina, as a fellow generator, can explain for all of us that she's had to literally dissolve so many structures in her life that were keeping the old the old life together. And um, yeah, I also am just a little bit curious about how this frustration of a generator differs from maybe the frustrations of other types, but maybe we'll get there when you talk a little bit more about the the next energy type because I still sometimes feel like I get frustrated too. I'm like, but I'm not a generator. So I'm kind of curious to hear more, but maybe we'll go into uh, the projector type. Yes, we certainly can. (laughs) Before we skip there though, there's a little kind of subtype in our sacral beings, which is called our manifesting generators. So Mm -hmm. they are pretty much like generators but just on steroids because they have this added (laughs) hybrid bit, which is the manifestor energy. So they're both a manifestor and a generator. Um, And they account for about 32 to 33% of society. So when we say like society is built for the sacral beings, we're saying it's the generators and the manifesting generators. They're the ones that can usually kind of accommodate society's Mm. expectations. But I think that's such a beautiful point, Sam, that, um, for sacral beings, it's such an act of courage to then step away from that society because you do fit, you do belong, you can upkeep it. You might not be satisfied, you might not be fulfilled, but you can certainly maintain it. Whereas for our other energy types, which we'll get to in a second, we can't maintain it. We, we've tried. We've spent our whole lives trying to maintain it and we can't. So the, the decision to leave it is a lot easier. It's a lot more clear. Mm. Um But our our manifesting generators are, like I said, they're like generators on steroids. They have all of those qualities of the generator, right? That sacral being, that responsiveness, creation, productivity, um, feeling satisfied when they respond to the things that actually light them up, except they're also kind of visionaries. They're a bit out of the box. They like to do things that are not on the normal path. They're here to innovate. So they're here to respond to Mm. stuff and change it and move it. Um, our manifesting generators are typically the only multitaskers in society Mm. because they do best when they are juggling five different things at once and bouncing between them so that they're never getting bored. Whereas generators really are here to kind of find one thing at a time that lights them up and master it to, to go at that and produce it and build it over and over and over again until they master it. Mm. Manifesting generators, they don't care about mastery. They care about shortcuts. Like how can Mm. I take the most number of steps in the shortest space of time so that we can innovate this, change this, and then I'm done with it. It's dead to me. I'm moving on to the next (laughs) thing. Yeah. So we see manifesting generators 
kind of, they get in their own little bubble where they think that their speed of life is the normal speed and everybody else is slow. And so we even get this kind of conditioning between manifesting generators and generators where manifesting generators will be saying to generators, hurry up. Like do, do more, move faster, take more stuff on. You have so much more potential. Actually, no, that's that's not correct for you. But it is for a manifesting generator. Consequently, manifesting generators have also been told their whole lives to slow down and mm. just focus on one thing, stick at something, and then maybe you might succeed when really what they need is freedom to do all of the different things and to move on really, really quickly. So... Mm. We see heaps of, we call them MGs. We see heaps of MGs in um, like celebrity circles, in politics, in music, um, in sports, because these are the people that need a high volume of energy to be able to sustain that level of work. And Mm. they do beautifully, they do beautifully at it. Like great example of an awesome MG is Pink. Look at the way that Pink does her stage performances. The woman is not just singing, she's doing an acrobatics performance in front of thousands of people. It's like an obstacle course. (laughs) It is, right? That's that MG energy being used in beautiful alignment, kind of like, I'm not part of society. I'm a bit different to you guys. I could do it your way, but I'm going to do it my own way. And that's going to create something really, really beautiful. Yeah. That's such a good example of a man manifesting generator. That was so helpful to like crystallize that into my mind. Yeah. (laughs) I see now you'll think of MGs and just see pink in front of yeah. you, like climbing up yeah. silks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Then we move into our non-sacral types. So we've got these two sacral types, the generators and the MGs that make up 70% of society. So the, the broadest group in the whole of society. And we, we have a sacral society because of that. And then mm. we have the remaining 30%, which is the other three types, which are us teeny weeny little unseen <laughs> non-sacral types, which is the projectors, the manifestors, and the reflectors. So the projectors <clears throat> sit at about 20% of society. So pretty, pretty small. And as I said, they're non-sacral. So they're the first of the energy types that do not have access to that sacral energy consistently. They can't respond all the time they can't produce and create they don't have a lot of physical energy they can't keep up you can always spot a projector because they're the people who are like i need a nap can i have a nap when is their nap Mm. time i just (laughs) they do beautifully taking daily naps the awesome thing about a projector is they are here to see things that other people don't see they're Mm. here to create efficiency a projector will always know the most efficient clear-cut way forward and they are compelled by this overwhelming desire to guide people through that to teach people (laughs) I can Mm. see it I I can see and I just want you to know so that you can also see and then we can all be better together yeah Mm. so we've seen that our online space of coaches given that that has become such a big space over the last few years vast majority of them are projectors of course. Me. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny to hear you say this because um, I just actually onboarded a one-on-one client today and we were chatting and she was kind of asking me like, oh, like how, how do I answer some of the questions that you asked me? And I said, you don't have to worry about saying anything perfectly or properly. You just speak. I will hear what I need to hear. Like I will literally read between all the little lines. Just speak freely is what I said. So it's, it's so funny to hear you say that now. Yeah, projectors have what we call a penetrating aura. You, The downside is that you don't actually have the ability to shut it off. So <laughs> projectors are always penetrating every piece of energetic data everywhere <laughs> and you're pulling mm. it in and, and kind of calculating it, categorizing it, processing it and refining it into what does this mean, what do we do with it, what's the most efficient way forward. This is why wow. projectors get tired. Because wow. when you when you go to the mall or you go to a cafe, you're processing all of the energetic data around you. Um, my husband is a, a projector as well. Bless them. I love projectors. And we went to the Ed Sheeran concert a couple of years ago, and it was our first big group experience outside of COVID lockdowns. Mm-hmm. And I, as a, a manifester, have a completely different auric quality. So I'm able to push people away from my energetic field. 
My poor projector husband is not. So we were there with 115,000 people. And every minute his energy was dropping further and further and further and further down because he was saying to me, I don't, I don't have a shield. I can't, I can't stop mm. all of this energy coming in. I'm just, I'm trying to process it and I'm getting stressed and I'm getting tired. Um, and that's so accurate for a projector. You it's need so to interesting. Have- Sorry, I was just going to say it's so interesting because I have um, another one of my really good friends. She's a projector and obviously Sam is too, but they're so polar opposite. Like I would never assume that they were the same. And so even with this whole energy thing and your energy draining, that's actually very much me. I, I, when I'm around a lot of people in a huge crowd, I tend to just start to drain really easily. Whereas I feel like Sam in most cases actually gets energized by being around a lot of other people. So it's interesting how there's some overlap. And I think maybe that's why I've been not confused, but really curious about human design because I mean, I guess astrology is the same where you kind of see yourself in a lot of the different signs or types. Um, So yeah, I would just love for you to speak on that. You know, how, what would that mean for somebody if they are a projector, but they don't take naps or they don't drain their energy? Yeah. Yeah, it's usually referencing one of two things. It's either that you are operating out of a conditioned state where you have been taught to be like a different energy type. Often mm-hmm. the non-sacrals are taught to be sacral, right? The the projectors in particular are often taught to be manifesting generators because mm. you have this ability to take in lots of information. Why can't you move faster? Why can't you sustain yeah, it? Why can't you, that sounds like you me. do it really quickly? Yeah. And so we become very comfortable in our conditioning because that's where we experienced acceptance and belonging and approval, right? That's where we fit in by behaving in our conditioning. So that's very, very normal. The other aspect is that there's usually a nuance in one of the deeper layers in your human Mm. design. Mm -hmm. The next layer down is, is profiles, which I can definitely speak on. And profiles are, are kind of this, like, yes, maybe you're a generator, but perhaps some of the aspects of your profile make you quite an introvert. So maybe you're not the same as other Mm. generators. And then we Mm -hmm. go down and down and down and down. And this is where human design becomes more and more individualized. It's the onion. discover it further. It's the onion. Yeah, it's the (laughs) onion. Yeah. Um, So typically uh, projectors will always do really, really well in areas where they're teaching or they're guiding. They have to be invited. That's the semantic with projectors Mm. when you're not invited to share your advice as a projector you come across like sandpaper to other people (laughs) like nobody wanted to hear it nobody asked for it you will get kind of ostracized and criticized and judged and pushed out which is so hurtful for projectors to Mm. experience then they move into self-worth spirals and self-doubt and they will start to put up walls and projectors in their not self theme get very bitter I'm never accepted Mm. anywhere nobody recognizes my talent the best way to love a projector is to recognize them just Mm. say oh my gosh I appreciate you I love what you just did aren't you beautiful I invite you to do more if you want advice go to a projector because the moment (laughs) you say can you help me with this the projector is there with like a manual and a textbook and a thousand resources and they will sit with you through till the end they are the greatest lovers I think Mm. of all of our energy types and they're so beautiful to be around when they're working in alignment with their own energy Mm. just Mm -hmm. just waiting to be invited it's okay the invitations will come Yeah, that's so funny because um, something I've had to coach myself on over the past few years is that is not to coach unwarranted. So when people are either, uh, you know, venting about something or just sharing something, I'm kind of listening for the cue that they want advice because sometimes they just want to speak. And I've definitely give unwarranted coaching advice before. So I always joke um, to my clients that I get to get my coaching sort of exercise through you all because you choose to be here. I don't do this with my family members and my partner, (laughs) or at least I try my best not to because no one wants to hear me be coachy when they're just yeah. talking about their their day or whatever, right? Um, yeah. And I dealt with this a lot in my childhood because I was, I was ostracized for sure for being too blunt. That was something I was mm. told a lot as a kid. Like, you're so blunt. And I didn't know 
I, I just heard it and thought, I guess that's bad. But then I went home and I want to say my mom is a protector too. I told her that someone told me I was blunt and she was like, that's a good thing. We're being honest. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I didn't internalize it too badly, but it, it's just interesting. Yeah, I've definitely been told that I'm I'm too honest before. Yeah, it's it's remarkable the difference that that strategy makes of waiting for the invitation. And we all have our strategies, right? For generators and manifesting generators, you need to wait to respond, which means only respond to the things that you really enjoy, right? Don't respond mm. to everything. Pause, wait check with your sacral. Is this lighting me up? Yes. Go ahead. Is it not? No, I'm not going to do it. Whereas projectors are waiting for the invitation and that difference of a projector who has waited for the invitation versus the one who has not waited for the invitation changes everything. And this is as somebody who is not a projector, but is surrounded by projectors that I love and adore and appreciate when they come to me with uninvited opinions and advice I want to gouge their eyes out with my fingers. <laughs> Do, it's, it's like nails down a chalkboard. I didn't ask for that. I didn't want it. You're inserting it into my space without my permission. But I could get exactly the same advice from exactly the same projector about exactly the same issue. And if I've gone to them and said, what do you think about this? And they give it to me, it feels like the most nourishing thing in the world. Mm. Yeah. So that waiting mm. for the invitation is key. It's pivotal for a project. I and have change your experience of the world. Yeah, mm. I, I I have a question about the responding versus the waiting because those yeah. to me right now sound like the exact same thing. Um, I, I've read a lot about generators and you know responding to things, but then where I get stuck is because I think I've been trying to live maybe like maybe like a projector, maybe Manjan, where. I tend to try to initiate a lot of things and mm -hmm. I like I have a lot of ideas so I try to jump into them but I do find since learning this work responding does feel better because it gives me a moment to really check in with myself but sometimes I'm like I don't have anything to respond to <laughs> or if there's something that I want to do I don't know how to create a question for me to respond to if that makes sense like if there's something that I'm trying to do but nothing's really giving me anything to respond to. I feel like I'm supposed to just, I don't know, do nothing. So I would love for you to clarify the difference yeah, the between waiting, waiting is hard. and responding. Because I feel like that's, to me, the same. Because you're waiting for something to respond to. <laughs> yeah, classic, yeah. classic generator, classic generator. <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. I love witnessing it. It's like a little <laughs> sociology experiment. Um, so... I mean, the next non-sacral group down is the manifestors, which is the group that I'm in. We're at only 9% of the population and we are the ones who are the initiators. So mm. only 9% of society actually has the energy to start something out of nothing. But we have developed a society largely driven by capitalism and the industrial revolution where we highly prize the ability to initiate right? It, yes, it becomes yes. almost toxic in our focus on that. Look at the way that we applaud entrepreneurs. Like, oh my gosh, you initiated, you started something, you created something out of nothing. Manifestors are the only ones who actually have the aligned energy to do that. And consequently, ironically, we're the ones who are conditioned to not do it. We're the ones who experience mm. all of this social pressure to say, that's too threatening. That's unpredictable. We don't like it. Go back, be small, be predictable, do what we want you to do. Whereas everybody else in society, but massively amongst the generators, we see them trying to be the initiators. Generators <laughs> coming forward saying exactly what you so beautifully articulated, Gina. But I, I want to do this thing, so I have to start it. And if it's not there, then I have to fabricate a way that I can make something that I can then respond to that then I can actually use. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's yeah. not how the energy is designed to work. And it's okay if that's the the kind of pathway you want to choose. It's, it's just going to be self-sabotaging. That's all. It's always going to lead to that same loop of, but now mm. I'm frustrated. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. And now I'm frustrated, right? So <clears throat> if you want it to feel satisfying, You've got to approach it with a different method. And that for a generator is learning to slow down into a trust relationship with the universe around you, that you are going to be presented with the right things to respond to when they are there. The mm. timing is correct, but it's well outside of your control. So mm. you can try to create things to respond to, 
And maybe initially they're going to feel good, like, ah, yeah, this is the pathway or this is the thing I'm doing and I'm going down it. But it, you'll feel frustrated and it won't come together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Same, I, same okay, deal that's... for our projectors. Like learn, learn to trust that the invitations are coming. They'll be there. (laughs) Well, it's just so funny to hear you say this because definitely, yes, we have been conditioned to initiate and it's almost as if we're being told to not initiate is to not take control of your life. Mm -hmm. Sort of like you're just being passive. You're just casually waiting. Like if you want to go out there and get it, you got to grab it by the balls, you know, like that kind of energy. And I also have a lot of Aries in my astrology chart. So it feels like, yeah, I got to go for it. And so I, as a projector, I'm like evaluating this information, right? As it comes in, I evaluate every (laughs) single thought. This is so interesting. I didn't know that other people didn't do this until literally maybe a week ago when I talked to Gina, because I'm talking to other people about it now, but I perceive everything through the filter of whether this is helpful to me or not. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't hear it and think like, ah, interesting. I'm like, is this helpful? Like, I don't, I don't even know if I'm going to accept this into like my, my vortex yet. It has to meet the criteria. And so even as you say that, I'm noticing my mind go into, is it helpful for me to think as only 90, as only 9% of the population as an initiator? Like, I'm already evaluating that thought. I'm like, (laughs) I don't know if that's helpful to me and if I'm supposed to wait. So I would love for you to speak to that because I have a lot of, I suppose, conditioned initiative energy, I feel like I'm always starting. Like my whole life has been like, I started it, I finished it, I made it. Um, And then a little bit of man gen too, where I'm like, okay, now I'm over that and I want to do something else. But the idea of waiting feels like I'm not moving it it forward. Like Mm -hmm. it feels like I am just being laissez-faire and life is just moving me along and whatever direction it sees fit. And my will is just not a part of the equation. So I'd love for you to speak to that because I think a lot of people might resonate that I don't want to wait. I want to initiate. Yeah. We've, we've equated initiating with ambition and it's not. The two things are (sighs) completely different, but somewhere in our society, we kind of got that all muddled up. I, I think that it's this sort of perversion that we've taken with masculinity that we've made masculinity a toxic, unhealthy thing. And the masculine is the structure and it's the drive and it's the thing that that pushes energy forward and makes it usable. So, of course, it makes sense that you'd shove initiating in there. (laughs) Well, if (laughs) if you can start things, great. You're like the golden Mm -hmm. egg of society. But the reality is I think for every single one of us, regardless of your energy type, regardless of even the deeper layers of your human design, whether it's your profile, your authority, your gates, your energy centers, your channels, all of these aspects of it, we experience a level of social conditioning on every single aspect of our design, which is the very, very um, kind of disheartening, sad grief part of the process, whether that's through human design or anything else. I think when we go through any system of self-awareness, of healing, of energetic development, we always come to a grief part of the process where we realize I was born pure. I I Mm -hmm. was born correctly. And then I started to gather hundreds of thousands, if not millions of experiences that told me that I was not correct. And so I've adapted over time until the thing that was incorrect is now normal for me. And I don't know how to find my way back to what is normal because this is where nervous system regulation gets involved, that Mm -hmm. your nervous system has already determined that what is quote unquote correct for you, the way that you were actually meant to be is now unfamiliar. So therefore it's unsafe and it's Mm -hmm. going to feel uncomfortable. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. But we need to allow ourselves to go through a journey of letting it play out. That growth is never, ever going to be a process of, oh, like I'll I'll just swap swap this thing in. I'll move that thing out and I'll swap this thing in. There was a reason that you were operating in that way in the first place. There's a reason Mm -hmm. that we're conditioned to be like generators or manifesting generators or manifestors or anything else. And it's, it's individual. It could be down to the way that your parents were. 
It could be down to like the ancestral lineage that you came from, the culture that you were born into, the gender that you have, even things like sexual identity, you, the education system that you were in, um, your socioeconomic status, all of this, it all plays in to your conditioning. And so while we can see some general brush strokes, like, oh yeah, we see a lot of generators behaving like manifestors. We see a lot of projectors behaving like manifesting generators. Everyone's going to have a unique flavor on Mm -hmm. why they did that. And I think I found for myself, rather than approaching it within my own journey, which I used to of criticizing myself for it, like, why, why am I so conditioned? Why can't I just be what I know Mm. myself to be? Why does this all have to be kind of so misaligned and so difficult? When I stopped doing that and started approaching myself with a level of compassion from understanding that I'm conditioned because at a certain period of my life, that was the adaptation that I needed to make for survival. Mm -hmm. That was correct for me then, but it's not correct for me anymore. The whole Maya Angelou quote, when you know better, you do better. I think that's what it all comes down to for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And so I'm kind of curious to know from your perspective and this paradigm of human design, then what, what is the difference between ambition and initiation? Because you're right. As soon as I heard that, I was like, those sound the same to me. Like, (laughs) like, like if you're ambitious, like you're starting things like, and you're going for them. So I'm kind of curious for all the initiating girlies and boys, what's the difference and how can we be ambitious within our own energy type without constantly trying to initiate? Cause it sounds like 91% is not really aligned to be doing that. No, not really. No. And even the 9% we're conditioned to not do it the correct way too. So I think we all have difficulty with initiation. Ambition is a state of going big, right? It's big dreams for the sake of big dreams. It's, It's not even about let's set big dreams and then ensure that we achieve them. It's that expansion of I've been in a contracted place. Can I use ambition almost like hope actually to expand Mm. myself out of this, to think bigger, to see bigger, to feel bigger, to want for bigger than what Mm. I've got. The journey is in how far can I stretch the edges? How ambitious can I really be about what I really want in my life? Whereas initiating is the process of taking nothing and creating something. Where there Mm. was nothing before, there is now something. So everybody can be ambitious. Everybody can. And even in human design, we have a series of gates, which are kind of a few layers down, but one of the gates is the gate of ambition. So we even see people with the gate of ambition. It's gate 54 for anybody listening. Those people are hugely ambitious. Those are the people that just sort of ooze ambition like it's oxygen, whereas the rest of us are then conditioned to try to catch up like oh man I need I need to be ambitious like that like I need to have bigger goals and bigger dreams yeah the the process of initiation is an energetic process not everyone Mm. can actually create something from nothing you can create something from response you can create something from invitation but a manifester is the only one who has the energetic qualities required to create something from nothing to move Mm. matter that we cannot see into matter that we can see. So as manifestors, we talk within ourselves about the ability to take the 5D and make it 3D. And the way that we do that is by receiving what we call creative urges. We receive these sort of, they're not ideas, they're not visions, they're they're like a a baby, they're like an energetic pregnancy. We Mm. receive this thing that comes online in our body And all of a sudden, we become obsessive about creating it. We go from zero to two and a half thousand energy watts in a second and a half. And everything about us wants to create that thing. We have to initiate it. We have to birth it. It's ours. It's our responsibility. But because that initiation process is so energetically taxing, to genuinely create something out of nothing is mm. is like pregnancy, right? This, mm-hmm. this is what the female body is doing. It takes nine months for the female body to be able to do it. And it actually takes two years for the human body to recover from a pregnancy. So we see that same quality in manifestors. Once we've initiated something and the initiation process is done, 
we cannot go any further. We can't. We can't sustain it. We can't manage it. We can't continue to interact with it. We just have to birth it and get it out into the world, which you betcha is, of course, a place of conditioning for for manifestors Mm. (laughs) because then we're conditioned from all of the sacral beings to say, well, why didn't you stick at it? Why didn't you keep Mm. doing it? Because it was beautiful and it was amazing and why did you disengage from it? Mm. Because... Well, once we've initiated something, then we have to go back into a long period of rest. So manifestors Mm. working in alignment will do this weird energetic thing, which we call the creation rest cycle, where we will like hop out like we've, you know, jumped out of the jungle in camouflage gear and go, ta-da, here's this thing (laughs) created and it's massive and it's huge and it has this big impact and everyone's really engaged with it. And then we dip back into the shadows again. And we disappear mm. and you won't you won't see us for months and months and months at a time while we rest and then we'll unpredictably pop out again. So that true process of initiation, although beautiful and magical and absolutely necessary because for everybody else to have something to respond to, something to innovate, something to guide, mm. something to be invited to, the manifester has to initiate it in the first place. If we don't, then we're kind of letting down the whole chain after us. Mm. But we have developed so many fears and wounds around doing that because we're uncontrollable, we're unpredictable, and therefore we get seen as threatening. Mm. Society doesn't like that, especially if you're a female. Female manifestors have this extra <laughs> extra layer added in there. So That's I think so that interesting. We have a lot of healing to do around what initiation actually is and how we how we hold it as a society. Yeah. Mm. I like how you explain how it's like this. I was just going to say, is it like a giant clock and cogs? And it just feels like everything kind of works together harmoniously. And I guess, like you said, the manifestors are creating the things that everybody else responds to. It To me, it almost looks like they're, they do their initiation stuff and then they kind of pass the baton on and that's where like, I would run in and (laughs) respond and then maybe would I then invite in the projector or like, is it designed to be that way? Like it is kind of this moving cog pieces and we're all supposed to be moving harmoniously together. Yeah. I mean, everybody has their role. That's sort of the the purpose of the energy type layer is that it shows us what's your energetic role in creating a harmonious collective where we're all contributing Mm. our own unique and individual assets to create a collective collaboration so that we're moving forward. And if we were to put that into a nice, neat little timeline, understanding that, right, there's always nuance and there's always flexibility and humans are going to do things in their own individual ways, putting it in a nice, neat package would look like the manifester is the one that initiates something and then the projector sees that as an invitation and wants to guide that thing so that everybody mm. can efficiently get access to it, which is why manifestors and projectors often end up working together in, in easy harmony. Then our generators will come in and say, oh, that thing that you've just guided into access for us, I want to build it because I'm really lit up by that, that thing. I love that. I'm going to mm. build it. I'm going to sustain it. Then our manifesting generators come in and say, that's amazing. Let's make it better. I'm going to innovate it. I'm going to make that different. I'm going to change it. And then we hit our fifth group, which is that 1%, which are our reflectors, our kind of unicorns, energetically speaking. And the reflectors are energetic, completely open. They have, they have kind of none of their own defined energy. They're reflecting, they're mirroring everything, which of course is extremely tired, tiring, sorry. And that's why they're, we yes. don't find them very often. <laughs> they often wow. live on like permaculture farms or you know like yoga retreats out of town or you know they're digital nomads like we don't see reflectors in society much because they can't keep up Hmm. but the reflectors are here to have processed all of that they see the whole journey that everyone has gone through and they take a full lunar cycle a full 28 days to move all of that energy through their body and then they reflect back the wisdom they say huh this is what we just did This is what it meant to us. This is what we've learned. And maybe this is where we need to make changes. Yeah. And then, Mm. of course, we loop back to the manifester again. Cool. Like the manifester receives another initiation and down the line we go. So in in an ideal, very succinct, lovely packaged way, that's sort of how it's always working. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, this makes sense when you think about how our species is actually adapted to evolve as a group, not as individuals. And I think all the time about how our society has become composed of individual structures, not structures to support many different hallmarks and characteristics like me having a weakness here is totally fine because it's being outfitted by someone else with an opposing strength over here we're kind of conditioned to all be self-sufficient beings so we need to be initiating completing reflecting building all at once and Mm -hmm. you know i think about that in terms of me as a sole entrepreneur and gina as well i mean we work together but we run our own businesses I would love to hand certain things off to different people. And sure, I could scale and do that. But I feel like that would require – I need like assistance to even do that. But it seems like I'm being asked to do everything. And I think that's why so many people are so burnt out because we're not yeah. actually designed to do everything. And um, now that you've actually displayed or demonstrated rather the difference between ambition and initiation – I see the difference because something I've always said to people is that I can't, it's almost like I feel like I can't create it, but I know if I like it or not. So for Mm -hmm. example, when it comes to like decorating a room, like if you handed me an empty apartment and you were like, decorate this, I'd be like, I literally cannot. Like I (laughs) cannot. Like I need like pictures, references, like someone else needs to get in here and then I can look at it and be like, okay, I like it and I want to like change these things about it. So that's really interesting because initially when you started talking, I was feeling a lot of inner conflict because I was like, oh, I feel like I create things from nothing all the time. And I guess technically speaking, you could say that's still true for everyone. Like we, we have thoughts and then it turns into things, right? Like Sure. I don't know what you would call I don't know what you would call this. Like if I thought to myself tonight, I want to make spaghetti and then I made it, wouldn't that have been going from wouldn't that have been initiating? You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, but it's the origin of the process if you want to get down into kind of the little uh... which is a cool area, right? It's you are very likely responding to an invitational prompt from your body that your body says, I'm hungry. Uh... I want something, right? And then that's the invitation Mm. for a generator or a manifesting generator. You'd be responding to the impulse within your body. So much of the way that we're operating with energetics is entirely unconscious. We're not seeing anything, even, even manifestors who are here to actually initiate. We're not seeing where we're initiating from. We don't, Mm -hmm. we don't know where that impulse comes from. We only speculate on it. I'm like, Oh, does it come from the universe? Does it come from 5d consciousness? Does it come from God? Is it source? Is it our ancestors? Is it, what is it? We just, mm. we know that we just receive it in our bodies and then our urge is to initiate it. Whereas for, mm. for every other type, there is a level of responsiveness. Oh, I've received this thing. And then I want to respond to it for projectors. I want to respond to it as an invitation for generators and manifesting generators. I want to respond to it if it kind of meets my threshold of lighting me mm. up um, and for reflectors is I, I want to respond to it as something to dig into, to reflect on, to process, and then to mirror back. Mm-hmm. So mm. we're all in that, in that way, we're all initiating. We're all doing yeah. it. Right. That was helpful to hear because that was going to be one of my questions is can like, do the res- do we have to respond to only things outside of us? Right. Because sometimes I do yeah. get this download and I'm like, Ooh, and I want to respond to that. But then I'm like, wait, do I have to wait for somebody else to come to me with the same idea? Uh, I gotta but wait I love for someone that. to email me that and then I can <laughs> respond to it. Yeah. yeah. I'll like ask somebody else. I'll put it into their vortex so they can bring it back to me. But <laughs> that's, that's, I think that is starting to really land in my body where I can definitely sense like sometimes I even go out into nature and I like to have these like solo retreat days where I'm just alone I have no timeline of where I need to be anywhere and I will just sit in front of the ocean or in front of a tree and I will ask my body are we ready to go and it'll say no not yet or it'll say yep this is complete and that does feel very much like I'm giving myself something to respond to to really check Mm -hmm. in to see you know versus just feeling done and then going. And that has been, um, yeah, really monumental in a lot of my just life. I think even with the transitions I've made in my career, really just checking in with myself and and attuning, does this feel right? What is like that gut feeling? And it's so funny. I know that with generators, with the sacral authority, like one of the things that I read a lot about is this 
um, the sounds that we make to, to certain oh, things. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I make so many noises. I'm always like, oh, or like, <gasps> like different, different sounds like that. So that was pretty funny to learn um, yep. that we make guttural sounds. <laughs> you do. We call them the sacral sounds and it's, it's only sacral yeah. beings that do it. It's only generators and manifesting generators. Um, and it's because that sacral has, it's a life force energy. And mm -hmm. in human design, all roads lead to the throat. So ultimately, whatever your energy is doing, it wants to come out of the throat because the throat is the center of manifestation and communication. So all of your energy mm. is in the end, in some way, going to come out of your throat. It just takes on a, a kind of different nuance depending on you know, mm. other aspects of your chart. But um, generators in particular, yeah, will very unconsciously make sacral sounds where um, when they're excited by something, they'll go, ooh, ooh. You like that's cool. They get really like bouncy <laughs> with their voice, right? Or when they're frustrated by something or they dislike something, they go, Oh, oh. oh my god, <laughs> she literally does that. I mean, I'm also a very guttural noise making you machine, yeah. but Gina, number one noise, <laughs> oh. <Yeah>. number one, <laughs> literally makes it at least once a day, uh, Mul multiple <laughs> times a day, yeah. Oh. yeah. It's beautiful yeah, to yeah, see. It's that. such an awesome expression of your body just just moving its energy out. And um, mm -hmm. in my family, my husband is a projector. I have three kids. One is a, a projector and one is a manifester. So in our family, four out of the five of us are non-sacral beings. And then my poor little daughter in the middle is our only sacral being. She's a generator. <laughs> and this little, we, I call it reverse conditioning. Like we're reverse conditioning that kid to be a non-sacral she rests all the time she, she's always so like I'm tired funny. right <laughs> but since she was born she has been making sacral sounds she makes guttural sounds we always know when she's engaging in something that she finds frustrating because we'll hear it across the house we hear her like oh, oh. <laughs> She's oh trying to God, load washing into me. the washing machine and she's grunting as she's doing it and none of the rest of us do it we make noises of course but we don't express the way that she does so it's so cool when you start understanding some of these aspects of people because it gives you the ability to celebrate it to look mm. at those things and think man that's beautiful like look mm. look at you grunting that's an expression of your <laughs> sacral energy like that is so great you know like look at you giving advice to people it's such an expression of your projected mm. energy and it, it takes so the experience of relating with other people away from oh that's your individual quirk and maybe that's fun at first but then it starts to grind on me because that's different to me and I don't really understand it and it puts mm -hmm. it into a system of understanding that that's not a quirk that's that's you. That's exactly correct for you. And I love you. And I want you to be yourself. Mm -hmm. I want you to express exactly what you are. And I understand precisely how you're different to me and why that is such a valuable thing. I think the whole mm. purpose of human design is to help us love each other better. Yeah. Mm. Any system that does that is worthy, I think. I, I think so too. I think my favorite thing you said actually was at the beginning. I mean, you said a, many amazing things, but <laughs> at the beginning, how you said that it was a science of differentiation. And I thought that's so beautiful how we're all different and how we can appreciate that. And so yeah. what I would love for you to go into is that now that we understand how these different energy types may show up energetically, how we respond, whether we wait, whether we initiate, can you give us like a little short lowdown of what it would look like to manifest and live in business or alignment with our business for each type because yeah. yeah I think now maybe people are like okay I, I paused this podcast episode and I know what type I am but what do I change right like oh, oh I'm not responding the right it. way yeah what yes. do I actually do so I'd love like a mini crash course on like okay generator you're going to be in business like this manifester you're probably going to be in business like this or you're going to attract like this and then you know an idea of what projector and reflector would look like in terms yeah. of capitalism and the system that we live within mm -hmm. yeah definitely definitely so if we're taking this like broad brush stroke if we're looking at this as business but for anybody listening all of these principles are applicable to career too. So if you're, yeah. if you're not in business or you're not fully established in business, these principles apply to your, your whole life, your workplace, your relationships, your family, all of it. Generators, because you're here to respond to what lights you up, to succeed in business, 
All you really need to be doing is getting very refined in that process. This thing that's in front of me or that's around me, does it really light me up or do I feel obligated to do it? If I feel Mm -hmm. obligated to do it, it's a no. A really awesome task for a generator in business is to make a list of all of the things you think you should be doing and then make a list of the things that you actually want to be doing. Right? Mm-hmm. eradicate all the things that you should be doing start doing the things that you want to be doing because energy is an amplifier when your energy is working in alignment it will amplify it will expand so that's where we start to experience things like easy manifestation abundance financial security all of these other aspects that you're not even directly playing in you're not even specifically moving in that area. You're just working hard to align the energy in your vessel so that then what is mm. being received back to you, right, this law of attraction, if I am in alignment within myself, then what I am attracting is things that are in alignment with my energy, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Drop drop the shoulds. Stop giving your energy to the stuff that doesn't actually light you up. And if any of those things are things that absolutely have to be done for your business, maybe it's like taxes, right? Outsource it. Give it to someone else. You'll find a projector who loves doing taxes. I guarantee you, you'll find someone. (laughs) Sam, you want to do my taxes? (laughs) (laughs) I'm inviting you into it. Let's see. Let me me see if I want to respond to an invitation. Like... (laughs) My, my, yeah. <laughs> but I guess my question, the follow-up question to that, you yeah. know, a lot of people who are just starting their career or maybe they're just starting their passion project, what if you literally just cannot outsource that yet just for financial mm. reasons or whatever? How do we best cope mm. in doing something that's not in alignment of our energy type? What is the yeah. best way? There's two bits of advice. As somebody who has had many, many, many years in business, going through a lot of those loops over and over (laughs) again um the first is that try to just get the best balance that you can Mm -hmm. right we get we get very sort of fatalistic and very binary the whole like throw the baby out with the bath water kind of thing like well because i can't afford to get help with anything i i just won't even attempt to do the balance i'll keep going trying to do all of it myself but all you're doing is perpetuating more burnout perpetuating more misalignment which is not moving you forward it's not getting you anywhere So then you then manifest more of that and create more of that. So do what you can to create more balance. Are there things that you can drop that are not fundamentally necessary? Can you reduce the amount of time that you spend on doing the things that you feel obligated to do? Can you find ways that there might be people who are willing to support without costing a lot or without costing anything? Can you look at Mm -hmm. using cheap automation tools rather than hiring a person? There are lots and lots and lots of different ways that you can bring harmony. The other aspect to it on a very kind of just straightforward business front is hire before you're ready. Always hire before you are ready to hire because Mm. I guarantee you, this is coming from now 16 years in business, you will never, ever, ever feel like you have all of the money available to hire the person that you want to hire. You will never reach 100%, right? (laughs) Where you're like, no, I'm good to go now. I'm super secure. Mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I've yeah. hired mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of people over my years and never once, even when I was running multi-million dollar businesses, never once did I feel like, yep, I'm good. I can totally pay this person. I always had an element of, oh my gosh, what if I can't pay them? What if they come yeah. in and do this work and I somehow run out of money and I don't have the resources available? So what I learned, especially in the digital space is to start working with people in short-term projects where instead of like, I'm going to hire you to work, you know, 40 hours a week for me forevermore until the end of time, what I'm actually going to do is say, I've got this list of tasks and I think it's probably going to take this long to do and I've got this amount of money. Can you do that with me and get Mm -hmm. somebody to work with you short term? I personally have found that every single time I've done that, I've ended up keeping that person on. Because yeah. mm. when I free up my energy from doing the things that are not aligned for me and I give them to somebody who is aligned to do them, you guessed it, it creates more abundance. I start bringing more money in. Yeah. So it, mm-hmm. it perpetuates, it grows on itself. But yeah, Solid so we all, mm-hmm. we all get caught in that. Like, no, I don't have enough money to hire someone. Girlfriend, none of us do. <laughs> don't don't be so reckless. True. Right? Don't be irresponsible. Don't go hiring a person when you have zero dollars in your bank account and can't pay them anything. But also don't wait 
until, oh, well, when I'm, when I'm earning six figures, that's when I'll hire someone. You will never get to six figures if you are burning yeah. out your energy. Well, usually yeah. what ends up happening is you end up bottlenecking, right? You end up waiting until you you are way too busy and you don't have time to do it all. And then it's yeah. even impossible to hire somebody because you're too busy or you yeah. end up hiring the wrong person because you're so desperate to just get anybody. So I really love that you you added that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So our manifesting generators in business, are actually, they operate quite differently to generators where the best advice for generating generators in business, as I said, is to kind of look at your shoulds versus your wants. What's the thing that you actually want to master, the thing that you actually want to give your energy to? Manifesting generators mm. is like become more childlike, stop being so responsible, go in the opposite direction. What are all of the things that you want to do? Try them all. Give them a go. Don't make yourself commit to something long term. On a kind of branding and marketing level, it's also so helpful for manifesting generators to just stick themselves under a very broad banner. So don't mm. try to niche down into one specific area because you will inevitably feel trapped by your own niche mm. and you'll feel frustrated and you'll want to get out of it and you'll burn it down. So <clears throat> operate under a broad banner like spirituality, wellness, health, business, marketing, whatever it is, and then play with whatever comes up underneath. Don't be afraid to launch three or four different things at once. Don't be afraid to mm. run a program only once or, hey, all I do is like pop-up workshops. You want to join, you join live. That's it. <clears throat> it's really helpful for manifesting generators to just work with their ability to be sparkly when they're into mm -hmm. something. Right? <laughs> when you're into it, do it. If you want to keep selling it, make it passive, make it evergreen, mm. right? That way you're still bringing money in from it, but don't expect yourself to show up and run like a 12 month membership. Your energy is not going to be in the same place as it was mm. 12 months ago. Smart. And you'll, you'll feel obligated to stay, which means the energetic tone is going to be off and it will just stop selling and you'll start getting issues. Yeah. So become more mm. childlike, do more things, play more. Hmm. Yeah. When we move into our non-sacrals, our projectors, quite the opposite, are beautifully aligned with niching. Projectors are, are so amazing at identifying like, this is the thing that I love fixing. <laughs> this is the problem mm -hmm. that I love mm -hmm. fixing and I love addressing. That's my niche. That's my zone of genius. Mm. But the key for a projector is that because you're non-sacral, a generator is going to be able to pick a niche and show up for it over and over and over and over and over and over again because they're mastering it. They're getting satisfied in doing that process. A projector, you can't keep showing up live all the time. So you're going to have to work like all non-sacrals. You're going to have to work at finding automations, evergreen processes, passive ways of bringing things forward. So a lot of projectors in business, because they go into the coaching space especially, they get caught in feeling like they need to serve people one, one by one, right? And they'll fill up their books with one-on-one -on -one clients. Like, and I love them. I love it. When I'm in session with them, I'm helping them. It's so meaningful. I get recognized. I'm being invited, but I'm so tired. And I've got mm. five, six, seven clients on my books every day. And then I have to lie down and sleep and I'm too tired to even make myself food. I heard of one projector actually that was so kind of trapped in that system that she actually used to put, this is a little bit graphic, she actually used to put a towel on the chair underneath her so that she wouldn't have to go up to go to the bathroom in between client Stop. sessions. Stop. Right? Oh That's my gosh. the projector in overdrive. Like projectors wow. can get so tunnel visioned that they make really yeah. unhealthy choices. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Hmm. So learning, <laughs> learning to do less and find ways that you can get access to your work in ways that doesn't pull on you one-on-one. -on -one. So you might want to mm -hmm. look at group programs as well as one-on-ones. You might want to look at um, taking the things that you're teaching over and over and over again and put them into a course, write it into a book, right? Put it into a membership. Projectors are incredible at um, doing, running things like certifications and trainings because they put mm -hmm. all of this detail and all of this knowledge in one really succinct, clear, beautiful guided process. And then they take people through it. 
And it's amazing. That's amazing for a projector. So we even see in the human design space, we have a lot of people now doing certifications in human design and most of them are projectors mm. because they're, mm. they're teaching people how to be chart readers. They're doing teacher trainings and that's mm-hmm. amazing for them. Mm. Amazing. And then yeah, they definitely align. Ones. Yeah, I definitely align with that um, as a projector. But I think the thing that I battle with and any other fellow projectors may be here listening and thinking like, I feel like I'm constantly trying to do less. And now I've gotten to the point where I'm actually not even doing a lot. And I'm like, but it still feels like I need to do less, but I'm not even doing anything. <laughs> like that's, I honestly, if someone were to look at my day, they'd be like, you're not doing anything. And I'd be like, I know, but I mean, I don't, I don't fully agree with that. I feel like I, I have would a, think that you're doing more than you think. <laughs> Thank you. I think I have yes. a, I think I have a poor gauge on like what a lot or what a little yes. is. Yeah. Yes. But to me, yes. it really feels like, I I actually always live with like a looming thought that I could be doing like 10x the amount and yeah. like well. But I'm like, but I'm not going to because I know that's like bad for me. So I'm just going to not do a lot. But then I feel like I'm always underdoing. Yeah, I think it's part of the projector experience. Okay. <laughs> even, even when you are doing a lot less than what you used to, because maybe you're trying to come out of that manifesting generator conditioning, you're still doing way too much, way too mm-hmm. much. Wow. I think it, a, a very, very, if we want to put it in a, a kind of specific, a very, very good amount of work for a projector is somewhere between maybe two to five hours of work a day. And then you rest. That feels right. You sleep. That feels right. Yeah. <laughs> but well, it's of- funny because I feel like I think I'm fighting myself because that's pretty much what I do. Yeah, it's like cool. four to five hours a day. But then I'm like, all I do. I only worked for like four hours today. Like it feels like I should be doing something else. But yeah, are you getting your baseline is so much higher? Yeah. yeah. Are you getting everything yeah. done? Is the question. Is everything complete and efficient and resolved in those hours? Well, that's the funny thing. Uh, the answer is yes because <laughs> I talked to my coach last year about this entire. Uh, this spiral and theme where I was like, I'm just like, I just feel like I'm not getting it done. And she's like, but are you like, what, what were you supposed yeah. to do? And like, is it done? Yeah. I'm like, yes, it is. But there, and it just feels like there's always like another loose end that I could be tying. So that's my work is to get, is to just mm. see the work that I needed to do as done and that's it. But it yeah. feels like there's like an ongoing list of things that like keeps like moving itself up to the top of my mind but I'm like, oh, but I can deal with, I'm not supposed to deal with that right now. But then I'm like, but am I? It's, yeah, the projector experience, I guess. I mean, this hmm. is the tragedy of owning your own business is that there's always something to do. You will never reach any day as a business owner where you're like, oh my gosh, there's nothing for me to do. There's nothing for me to interact <laughs> with. Like, there That's is always true. something to be done. And yeah. projectors are so good at, with that penetrating energy, at seeing everything. But the wisdom is in learning. Is that a priority right now? As long as Mm -hmm. my energy is focusing on what is a priority and getting that done, then I am using my energy in the most powerful way because that's efficiency. Mm. You're not running around for the sake of running around, which granted for a manifesting generator is actually quite fine because they're enjoying the process of running around. A projector is not. That's just burning you out. So, um you know, a lot of projectors will come from that background where they're like, but I used to work 14 hours a day and it was totally, totally fine. It wasn't totally fine. You were burnt out. But just because comparably you're working five hours a day now doesn't mean you're not doing enough. It means that you're using your premium energy in better ways. And that's exactly correct for you. But there's also this aspect of being non-sacral too, right? So for projectors, manifestors and reflectors, we all experience it because we don't have sacral energy we actually have zero energetic understanding of when enough is enough when it comes to work. Hmm. Wow. Yes. yes. <laughs> wow. We don't, yeah. Like... We don't have like a switch in our body that says you're good now. You've worked enough. You're satisfied. Well, I don't think that typically we feel much satisfaction actually as non no. And so um, I joke about this with other non sacrals a lot that like, we don't know when enough is enough until we're a hundred steps beyond enough. And then, yes. then we're so wow. fatigued where our nervous system is fried and we are so exhausted. And then we think, oh, yeah, mm. I see. The line was 100 
steps ago. I probably should have stopped there, but I didn't have a body cue to tell me to do that. So I've had to learn to stop well before I think it's enough. When, when my mind is going, oh, oh, that's so oh, but hard. I, I, yeah, it's really hard. That's something I still journey through. But when you're in that space of thinking like, I've completed my list for today, but maybe I could just take on one, one more little thing. Maybe I could just do that quickly. Maybe if I brought that forward, then I wouldn't have to do it tomorrow, right? Maybe I could just give my energy to that. That's when that. you stop. That's the point when you stop. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. And your body wow. will thank you this for it. You'll feel better. <laughs> Yeah, this is wild. I'm I'm starting to learn how to trust my body more than my mind because yes, my mind always like, well, we could do that other extra thing and then tomorrow be more ahead and then have more of a clear day or whatever. But um, yeah, that piece about not knowing when we're done, that's crazy because I was working with a therapist who uncovered this pattern with me that I have to do everything to exhaustion, whether that's working mm -hmm. out, whether mm -hmm. that's like working on my business like I need to literally feel like I can't go anymore to be like okay we did it like we did yeah. it like I'll go to these I don't do this much as much anymore lol I did it yesterday but <laughs> I go to these like I go to these high intensity interval like boot camp classes that like yeah literally murder you you're like sprinting up these like inclines like at like I was like running like 10 miles an hour yesterday and then I like do these like abs and like I, I'm crazy because I feel like I didn't work out until I feel like I'm a dead body <laughs> like to just do like a little bit of light stretching or like Pilates is um it feels like I just wasted my time so I think that's the pattern I constantly get into is feeling like I've wasted my time unless I've somehow petered out to complete exhaustion, but it's just not sustainable. So yeah. it's a, it's a nervous system that, thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's not to say that nervous system dysregulation is not a thing for sacrals. It, it definitely is a thing for sacrals, but I think that for non-sacrals, we take on a slightly different aspect with our nervous system dysregulation where, um, we're so used to seeing being outside of our window of tolerance, so being in a stressed state in our in our nervous system functioning, as correct. Like yeah, yeah. Or, or if I'm if I'm stressed, if I'm working over my capacity, if I'm panicked, if I'm in fight or flight, that's actually how I get productive, and therefore that's now my normal. When that's not normal and that's not healthy, your nervous system is meant to be in a state of calm most of the time. Um, whereas mm. for sacral beings, it does, it it's, just takes on a slightly different aspect for them. There's a, a lot more of a swing outside the window of tolerance. Like, oh, I'm, I'm in the stress, like the sympathetic state. And then oof, now I'm jumping down to the dorsal state where I, I accidentally push myself too hard. All right. Now I'm disengaged. I'm disassociated. I've got to come back up again. So I, mm. regardless of, of who you are, or, or I think, um, what language or what system you use for self-awareness or self-development. I think we've all collectively now understood that we're at the point where we can't ignore nervous systems. Like, yes. Totally. That's been yes. the entire theme of our podcast for like yeah. a year. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can't, you yeah. can't get away from that. And we all have some level of dysregulation and human design is one system that is, is cool in terms of being helpful for seeing how you as an individual might be getting dysregulated and why that is. Mm. But um, it certainly is not a Band-Aid that is going to remove you from having to do the nervous system work. You're still going to have to do it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, as a generator, like I'm, that whole is exhaustion piece was definitely me, not with working out. I would never sign up for a class like that. There's no <laughs> way. There's no way. I'd be like, is there one where you just sit and stretch sitting in your chair? I'll take that one. Um, but with the working, I, I did not have an off button. You know, I would work 100 hour weeks, seven days a week. I never took vacation. If I had to, I would work through it. Um, I remember my job, my corporate jobs, I literally never went on vacation. I would just come back to work because I was like, no, 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 I like work. I, you know, work was such a huge part of my identity. But I was, I mean, I would say that I was doing what I loved and until I wasn't. And then there was a lot of discomfort, frustration, which then propelled me to do the next thing. But where I am now in my life is very much. I make decisions in my life and in my business from my nervous system. That's really what I'm responding to, right? Mm. Does this feel too much? 
does this feel like, what is this anxiety trying to tell me? Do I need to rest? So I'm moving much slower, but I am towing this line between, you know, this energy I have to do a lot, but yeah, kind of tempering that. And I think what I'm, what's happening to me right now is I almost have PTSD from the amount of stress I had before. So when I see more than two appointments on my calendar, I, I have a nervous system response where I'm like, <gasps> that feels like, feels like too much, but it's actually not. So I'm kind of coaching myself back into this is safe. This is different. And, and now when I look at my schedule, when I go through it, I'm padding my appointments with this, this break time in between. I'm really tending to my body. So it is allowing me to do more, but I'm also doing less. So I'm curious to see if I end up ramping up and taking on more once I'm really just doing what I'm meant to, but I would love for you to maybe riff on that if you have any comments. Yeah. I mean, the, the nervous system is built on capacity, right? So our, our window yeah. of tolerance in our nervous system is not a static thing. It's mutable. We can change the size right. and scope of that window of tolerance. And when we're in a dysregulated state, our window of tolerance is really, really small because we've been kind of hammering it yep. down by moving, you know, into sympathetic and dorsal and sympathetic and dorsal. And we're never in that window of tolerance. Part of doing nervous system work mm -hmm. is identifying what your window of tolerance capacity actually is and working with that primal yeah. function of your nervous system as you articulated, Gina, that like, just because this feels like a panic because it's unfamiliar doesn't mean it's unsafe. I need to yes. learn to soothe my nervous system in this because the primal function of the nervous system is unfamiliar equals unsafe, familiar equals safe. Yep. And this yes. is how we end up in patterns that are self-sabotaging and unhealthy, but they're familiar. So the nervous system mm -hmm. will say, I will take the devil I know rather than the devil that I don't know, right? Even if the mm -hmm. devil that I don't know is actually healthy. And it's actually good for me. Yeah. And we wonder why we get into toxic behaviors and self-sabotaging behaviors because <laughs> your nervous system is running the show and it just needs better capacity. So yeah. moving, moving into those spaces where we know intellectually, we know that this is correct and we know that it's safe and maybe our nervous system doesn't feel that way, we can work with soothing practices. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them, but it's, you know, breath work, meditation, hypnotherapy, um, somatics, body movement, like pick your flavor. There's so many ice yeah. creams in the buffet and, <laughs> and you know, do that self-soothing work. And in doing that, what you're actually doing is expanding that window of tolerance. You're building your capacity out until ideally we reach a point, I guess, where our capacity is at the biggest that it can possibly be. And our nervous system yeah. has learned that there are so many things that are actually safe and are yeah. actually now familiar. And this is part of the process of energetics in business that, yes, yeah. right, it, it's a muscle that we're stretching. The work that I do now, yeah. I could not have even fathomed being not only possible, but certainly not safe five years ago when I started in the, in my online business right. alone. And um, I met a friend recently, a beautiful projector, shout out to the gorgeous projectors. And um, <laughs> he's about two years into his online business. And he's, he's entering into that phase where he's moving from one-on-ones into doing group programs, digital group programs, right? And he's like, oh, stretching my nervous system, right? This is all from unfamiliar yeah. territory and I'm figuring out how to do it. And, um, you know, he was saying like, I... I can't imagine doing what you do, like hosting calls with 200 people and, you know, selling out programs to, to two and a half thousand people at a time and like guest speaking at conferences. Like, how do you, how do you handle that? Like, I was like, I, I built my nervous system capacity for it. I, yeah. Over time, you just meet the next thing in front of you and say, cool, in this moment with this thing, can I self-soothe? that's going to build the muscle so that next time when I approach it, it's familiar and it's safe. Mm. And then it becomes kind of a non issue. It's a non thing. This mm. is how we progress forward. But this idea that we have that anybody can just jump into 100% success in business, like, Oh, I can just set up my Instagram account and within a week be, you know, making seven figures and selling out programs. Like it's, 
Wait, you can't do that? I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) What? What? (laughs) Yeah, it's so much more energetic work than strategy. We talk about that all the time. All the time, yeah. Even if you could strategically do it, you energetically cannot do it. Totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like what what's really happening, you know, through the lens of human design in in my life right now is I'm basically deconditioning from thinking that I'm a man gen or, Mm -hmm. you know, able to initiate. And now I really am doing what I love. So it actually doesn't feel draining. And so I think that's what I keep on showing myself almost building this evidence of no, we're doing what we love. And I mean, at one point, my previous business was what I love, but then it reached that point where it wasn't, but I stayed out of obligation. Mm. And that's when it just felt so, so much harder. I was so unhappy, so stressed out. And I kept on trying to find a way to make it all work. Um, But ultimately, that's what pushed me to realizing, wait, this is definitely not working. And like I said, now I feel like I am in that I'm stepping into my true human design type. Um, I I do have one other question, though, um, because we've kind of talked about the overarching kind of bigger themes of the human design. But what would be one part of someone's chart that you would invite us to really focus on that maybe is not as well known? Um, I'm just curious to know what part of the chart we can kind of look in, because I know in astrology, I love learning about my south and north node. Mm, Yes. That was such a telling thing in our life. So is there anything like that that you would invite us to explore in our human design chart? Yes. I always, my vote always goes to profile. In in human design, Mm. the rhetoric is once you've learned your energy type, then you move on to strategy and authority. So strategy is how you use your energy. Authority is the energy center that you have that makes decisions. And I'm all for strategy and authority because they're pillars, right? You have to learn that. But I think I think the real juice exists in the profiles. That's the most mm. exciting bit for me because your profiles are these two numbers that you get that fit in with your energy. So you might be um, like a 6-2 projector or, you know, a 1-3 or, right? G- Gina, you're a 6-2 generator? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, yes. how, how did you know that? <laughs> I'm sure. So out those two profile numbers, they speak to not only our personality, the way that we see ourselves, but they also speak to how the world around us sees us and pushes us to behave, which is why it's so cool. So that first number that you have is what we call your conscious profile. And that's like 90% of your personality. Your conscious profile is mm. like, this, this is me. I've always known this about myself. Whenever you do a personality test, I guarantee you what you've come up with is the qualities of that conscious profile Hmm. because that's how you consciously see you. That's what you recognize of yourself and that's how you try to present yourself to the world. But then your second number, the unconscious profile, is how other people are seeing you. And we always feel this pressure between our two energies to Hmm. kind of show up to meet other people's expectations. But we do that Mm. through digging further into our conscious profile. So while other people Mm. are saying, but I recognize this in you, I want you to be this, this is how I see you, this is how you're amazing, and you go, "Eh, but that feels kind of like I get that that's me, maybe I have some of those qualities, but I don't feel so solid in them. I don't don't Mm. feel like I really have a a whole sense of ownership and grounding in that, so I'm going to dig into what I know to try and meet your expectations. So we run our profiles in one through six. There's only six numbers, but that makes 12 profile archetypes. And on a very, very kind of short, uh, like superficial basis, a one line is quite an introvert. So our one, two, and three are all introverted numbers. Our four, five, six are all extroverted numbers, but you can have a profile that spans both. So this is where we get Mm -hmm. people who are these sort of like socially ambidextrous, like, I'm mm-hmm. part introvert, but I'm also part extrovert. Like, that's, what's, that's what's Gina. the deal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're a yeah, six and two, so f- that's why. Yeah. But what's so funny is I just looked at my profile and I'm also a six two, oh, which also no probably way. is why we identify very similarly, consciously and within the unconscious. Well, it's funny because other people perceive us to be very similar as well. Yeah. So that kind of makes sense. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I love that. We'll have everyone Wait, definitely check then, out their profiles. But then the two would mean that you are more on the introvert scale. But if it's the second number, then that's how other people view you? No. So it just depends oh, okay. where where it sits on your profile. So for you guys, uh, okay. your six is your conscious. 
your two right. is your unconscious. So that's how other people okay. are seeing you, right? So like the, the one mm. is that introvert that is really invested in knowledge. They're the learners. They're the constant students. They're the ones who like before you go to a restaurant, they will have researched the menu and chosen what that's they wanted. That's literally me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the, me. the line twos, but they all build on each other. So if so yeah. for example, if you're a line six, you will have aspects of the one, two, three, four, and five as well. Right. Okay. And you'll resonate okay. with those. The line two is what we call the hermit. So still very, very introverted. They love to be away from people in their cave. The hermits are like, I really enjoy my own company in my pajamas on my couch. And if you can't offer me something that's more interesting than that, I'm good. Like I think I'll just stay where I am for long periods of time. Right. But the the hermit is naturally very, very creative. And so they'll end up in some sort of contextually creative field, whether it's um, like design, like interior design, um, graphic design, they become artists, musicians, horticulturalists, like they're naturally talented at something creative. The threes are what we call our martyrs. They're like the people who live life by trial and error. Like they have to learn by mm. doing. So they throw themselves into something and in the process of doing that, they make lots of mistakes and that's how they learn. So they're <laughs> typically like the one, the people who are like, do you know what? I just decided that I was going to climb the highest mountain in the world. But when I did that, you know, I lost three of my toes and I forgot to take my food with me <laughs> and, you know, and then they write a book and they go on a world speaking tour about <laughs> everything mm. that they learn. That's the beauty of the three is they kind of bring this levity to life. Like mm. it's valuable making mistakes. It's valuable taking mm. the wrong path because that's where you learn and we don't have to take everything so seriously. But then we cross mm. to the other side where we get the four, fives and sixes who are like the people people, yeah? So the fours, I'm a four, six, right? So as a four, I'm very extroverted. The fours are all about building networks, building communities. They're the people that you meet that you feel like, this person really sees me. I could just have a natural conversation with this person. It's super easy. It's intimate. We go beyond surface level. So I've utilized my four line. I built a community. That's my business mm -hmm. is the manifesto community. I've built a community of people where they feel seen, which is how you start mm. using your profile to leverage it, right? Like if I naturally do this, that's how I'm going to build my business. Yeah. Right. The line fives are our heretics. So they're essentially very opinionated right <laughs> you know those people who just have the solutions to everything like they can see the issue and they can see the solution and they sort of it's almost like this beautiful smugness that they bring it across with like <laughs> oh darling you don't know how to solve that I'll mm. I'll solve it for you <laughs> like I know the answer I'm surrounded by line fives in my business a lot of my staff are line fives because I like to bring the urge to them and say, oh, this is it. This is the thing that we're creating. And they go, uh-huh, there's some problems, but don't worry. We're going to solve them. <laughs> like we've I got the that. system, we'll put it in place and everything's going to be good. And so we get to create these really amazing functional things. Um, and then our line sixes at the end. And the line sixes are called the role models. It's kind of like the, the most embodied energy that you can have is always a line mm. six in human design and line sixes are about objective wisdom that we we take steps back right we observe what is going on we process we have this kind of weird rhythm as line sixes where we we get involved in something it's like we come out to the people for a while and we we get involved in the mix and we do the things that everybody else is doing and then we go hmm I've got enough of that now I'm, I think I've received what I need to receive and we step back and we observe and we process and we reflect and it is always, always, always for the purpose of there is a lesson in everything. I will find an insight. So role, like line sixes as the role models are the ultimate kind of teachers because we take our own life experiences and we say, oh, I get it now. Yeah, like none of that happened without cause. It was happening for yeah. me, not to me. And here's the wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I want other people to know that because I'm so invested in the world becoming a better place. Like we see line sixes, like left, right, and center in the spiritual space, of course, because we're always the ones that say, I want to take the darkness that I have experienced and I want to transmute it to light so mm -hmm. that other people are able to learn and grow from this in a really beautiful way. 
Um, but the quirky thing about the line sixes is that we go through three life phases. So zero to 30, you're actually operating as a line three. So if you're under 30 as a line six and you're feeling like, I don't have wisdom, I just have chaos. That's normal. <laughs> <laughs> you're meant to. You're meant to be living life by trial and error and having a lot of experiences that are challenging and don't make sense and that are in fact traumatic for a lot of us. Then once you yeah. reach your 30s, from 30 to 50, you go into a phase called being on the roof where the chaos stops and the reflection starts and you spend a solid 20 years just reflecting on the first 30 years of your life and gathering all of the wisdom and bringing it together and teaching other people. And then from 50 plus, it's called going onto the mountain, which is really where the line six has kind of come into their full embodiment where they start to teach things at a very um, kind of broad collective level and have a huge impact on people, but they're very separate to do that. And and because human design's only been around since the 80s, we actually don't have many line sixes that are in that mountaintop experience. Oh, yeah. Yet. Yeah. So we're only just starting to see them come through now. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe we'll be there in 20, 30 years. <laughs> yeah. I've got another 20 years to go, I guess. You'll get there. You'll get there. Line sixes are beautiful. You're on the roof. You're on the roof though, baby. I I'm on the yeah. roof. I'm halfway through the roof. <laughs> like I'm halfway through. I gotta keep breathing, keep going. Everything's gonna be yeah. fine. <laughs> keep taking the lessons, keep guiding. Yes. Well, this was just absolutely divine. And I think that so many people are gonna feel this beautiful value differentiation after listening to this. Yeah. And hopefully understand that they're not supposed to initiate every day and respond constantly and mm. work in this conditioned way. Unless of course it suits you and what you're responding to, like you said, sacredly as a generator or a man gen suits you, then amazing, respond away. But it looks like a lot of people after listening to this may have to reevaluate uh, the way that we use our energy. And me as a projector, I'm like, okay, four to five hours of work a day, that aligns. I need to stick with that. Yeah. Um, I've and I'm given sure you a, a lot of now. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, <laughs> which is what I wanted. I'm like, what measurement and filter will I use to as ascertain this information? But um, <laughs> I think a lot of people after this hopefully will feel just so seen like, oh, yes. yes, like I'm like that. And that makes so much sense, especially the piece about not really aligning with your energy type because of the conditioning. I feel like the only work we really do that is actually helpful to us as humans is deconditioning. It's 100%. everything that my work rests upon, Gina's work rests upon. We're just, I'm trying to get you back to being like the pureness that you were, like you originally mentioned. And so mm -hmm. I just want to thank you so much for bringing not just uh, your wisdom, but also a lot of history to the system. I think a lot of people had no idea the origination and even the definition and just square one. Yeah. So I think you just did an incredible job of giving us an overview. And it was such a great starting point for people. And of course, if they want to go deeper, I'm sure they can reach you and find out. But um, before we conclude, I would love to ask you the question we asked to all of our guests, yeah. which is which theme in your life, or you could even say not self theme because we're in the human design podcast here, um, <laughs> have you constantly had to cycle through in your life? So not something that you healed and sort of, you know, put away, but what's the thing that comes up over and over that you have to apply the bomb of self-love to? Yeah. I mean, for me, a significant part of my, my story and my ongoing journey, which I think will probably be for the remainder of my life is working on trauma. Um, and that's reflective of my childhood. I come from a heavily traumatic childhood. I, I've had uh, complex PTSD for over 20 years. And so trauma is always central to my story. But I think that in recent years, I've I've noticed so much more of um, very line six of me, right? Like now I'm objective. So I've noticed so much more <laughs> of a correlated understanding of there are so many more people experiencing trauma on so many levels that we just don't even see that it's yes. not even just that we don't have language for it. It's that we don't know what trauma is and we don't know how to mm -hmm. treat it. And it's not integrated into our systems of health and wellness and spirituality. Um, so it becomes even more of a focus for me outside of that personal space. It's always been part of my personal journey to work over and over and over again on healing and resolving trauma. But um, now it's become so much more pivotal as a focus in my work because I understand now 
there are cross sections everywhere. Trauma is influencing mm. our energy type. Trauma is influencing our decision making. It's influencing our nervous systems. It's influencing our relationships. It's influencing our spiritual identity. I mean, it's like, it's it's everything. Trauma is is part of everything. So, um, I think that I've now realised that that will probably be uh, sort of the very happy voluntary cross that I bear <laughs> for the rest of my life, um, and I'm proud in some ways to have had such an up close intimate experience with trauma to be able to speak about it in so many different ways and to so many different people Mm. but yeah on the on the days that I'm tired of dealing with trauma I think why am I not done with this I think that we all have those points in those healing loops that we go back to over and over like why is this not finished yet um and on my good days I realized no this is a it's a gift and um, mm. this is a blessing and an opportunity that's being afforded to me to reflect on this at a different layer and in a different way yes. from a different lens so I can understand it more so that I can not only heal myself but then I can sit with other people in that experience too and bring them tools and resources and space for healing in that too. Mm. So it's always a beautiful thing. Mm. That was divine. Thank you so much for bringing such a beautiful perspective on trauma and that it really is a gift. Um, It's hard for me to see it that way too, but it's true. I think that everything that I've gone through brought me into this space as well. And to this very moment on the leading edge, creating this conversation with you, which I think is going to be so helpful to so many conditioned and even traumatized people when it comes to their energy types. So I'm just endlessly, endlessly grateful and um, just Right before we sign off, I'd love for you to tell us where our listeners can find out more about their design type and uh, your work. Yeah. If you have not yet run your human design chart, there are so many options now available to you. You can literally just Google human design and it will come up. Mm -hmm. Um, My favorite chart generator is Genetic Matrix, but my God, you can can go with any of them, right? MyHumanDesign.com, my body graph, Jovian Archive. There's a dozen. It doesn't matter. Take your pick. Um, And... There are so many different human design teachers now that all bring their own perspective and their own language, which is so gorgeous because Mm -hmm. the way that I teach it might not resonate with everyone and it doesn't, it doesn't have to. So I always recommend for people to just go to Instagram and type in human design and start Mm. playing with the people that come up. Some of my favorites are Erin Claire Jones, um, Day Luna, Katie Calder, who mm. is at um, the Human Design Lady, Eden Carpenter. I mean, we've got some amazing voices. Jess Fields, like I could go on. Um, if you are specifically into learning about manifestors, so you are a manifester or you know a manifester and they are completely perplexing to you, or you're a human design teacher and you're trying to understand a manifester client. I am at the Manifesto community and we teach content specifically for and about manifestors because we're a weird, quirky, Mm. very misunderstood little (laughs) energy type. So um, my work is focused on providing healing and and servicing spaces for manifestors and non-manifestors to to understand that. But um, I'm really proud to be And look at you being in that niche. Uh (laughs) It's completely unintentional, wow. completely. That just happened, actually. <laughs> um, but I'm really proud to be in, in part of an industry that has now grown so much and now has yeah. so many voices that are bringing messages really authentically forward. So I don't think that it's a matter of um, like you have to start with this person in, in human design, like go go where it feels correct, go to the person that feels safe and feels like home and Mm. is providing that information in a way that actually lands for you. Mm. That is so beautiful. It just honestly goes to show how gracious you are. We've never had anyone recommend other people to learn about (laughs) the line of work that they do, but I loved that. The shout out to Erin Claire and Day Luna. I I follow those accounts as well, and I think they're all so valuable, but the fact that someone right now might be listening and learning that their quirky energy type of 9% is a manifester, and you are the go-to gal who has niched down and created that community for them. So I'm I'm so grateful. We'll definitely share your resources in the show notes, and and uh, we're so we're so excited for everyone to devour this. So thank yeah. you so much, Holly. Oh my gosh, this has been fun. This has been a really easy conversation. So thank you so much for being so open and so generous and so authentic. It's just it's a pleasure to spend time doing this. Aww.
Thank, Thank you so, so much. much we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.